Amen. Uh, up on the screen, we've got, I think, the, the final verse that we just landed upon, verse uh, 31. Um, we're going to dive straight in today. This is a wonderful passage. Uh, in fact, chapter 4 that we are looking at today is a continuation of chapter 3 that uh, Will opened up for us last week. But uh, the passage we're looking at today finishes on this verse. And I want to make some comments first about verse 31. And then we're going to circle right back through uh, the story and come back to this verse again. But I want us to really get this into our heart. And just as we begin, let me pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that we can be here this morning and we pray now in the name of Jesus that you would fill this place with your spirit as we open up your word. We pray that you would speak to us powerfully as you have spoken to your people in the past and we pray that we would learn what it is to be able to speak boldly as witnesses for Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's have a look at, at this verse. It's the final one in our passage today. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. There are quite a few things that are packed in to this one verse. First of all, notice that this is just after a prayer meeting. We're going to be finding, as we've just heard, as Phil was speaking to us, this was a meeting in which all the believers had got together in a time of considerable threat. And they had cried out to God, and they had cried out especially for one thing, and that was boldness. That teaches us from the get-go something really interesting. It seems that they didn't have it within them by themselves. Otherwise, why would they have cried out to God and said, we need this boldness from you? But they did. They prayed and God answered, it seems, straight away. We can see here in this verse, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. It was like an earthquake in the room as soon as they had prayed. It would have been quite startling, I should think. Can you imagine us sitting here and praying and suddenly the entire ground starts shaking? That would shake us up a bit, I think, wouldn't it? Might be a good thing for us. <laughs> but we're told in this verse that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Note two things about that. Firstly, it says all of them. This wasn't an answer just for certain people in the congregation. It wasn't an answer simply for the apostles because this was an entire group of the believers in Jerusalem at the time. This was all of them who were suddenly and powerfully filled with the Holy Spirit. The other interesting thing about that is this is chapter 4. Two weeks ago, Phil took us through chapter 2 in Acts, which is the day of Pentecost. That was the day in which the Holy Spirit was poured out for the first time upon the church. In some ways, it was unique. But this is interesting, isn't it? Because we've now got to chapter 4, and here the Holy Spirit again is filling the people of God there in Jerusalem. It's happening for a second time. So although there were certain things that were unique about the day of Pentecost... We learn from here and from other places in the book of Acts that being filled with the Holy Spirit is not just a one-time event. Rather, it is an event that we should be looking for constantly, that we would be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And look at the result. Not only were they all filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit they spoke the word of God boldly. It's a really interesting word at the end of that verse. Boldness. The Greek word behind that is a larger word probably than the English word boldness. Yes, it can be translated boldness as it is here. It can also be translated courage. 
In fact, in verse 13, that we'll look at a bit later, we find that exactly the same Greek word, parousia, is translated courage. But it's even broader than that. We think of courage and boldness perhaps in one sort of domain of life. But it can also equally be translated outspokenness. You know that sort of thing where you can't help but speak about something? That's this word in the Greek. The disciples, it seems, could not help but speak about what Jesus had done for them. There was this sense of outspokenness. And this same word can be translated freedom. What a wonderful thing. They were now filled with the Spirit of God and were able to speak the word of God with boldness, with courage, with outspokenness, with freedom. Don't we need that today? So many of us have forgotten what it is to pray. I say this of myself as much as of anyone. In fact, many uh, observers of the Christian church have noted how in the past couple of generations, prayer has greatly diminished amongst the people of God in the Western church. It's not quite the same story out there in parts of Asia and Africa and Latin America. Um, there, often the believers really know what it is to pray. But in the Western church, there has been this great diminishing of prayer. In fact, prayer so often now has become, for us, a small thing. I think it's, it can be really instructive to remind ourselves what prayer was like for the early New Testament church and to compare it with what uh, prayer has become in our own lives. Can we see that back in New Testament times, the picture that we get is that prayer was a large thing for the people of God. We see it even in the life of Jesus himself. There's a famous verse, Luke uh, chapter 5 and verse 16, which says that, uh, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. In fact, to places in the desert to pray um, is, the, is the way that it reads there. And we can see from that that Jesus was in the habit of getting away from the crowds and going and praying not just for a little time, not with just a few words, but for hours and hours. In fact, we're also told that Jesus himself would go sometimes and spend entire nights in prayer. At the beginning of his ministry, he went and spent 40 days praying and fasting. The very night before he was crucified, he was there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And remember that sort of gentle rebuke of his disciples? He said, couldn't you even pray with me one hour? As if that was a minimum. But they didn't because they were weak at that point. The disciples were not yet people of prayer, it seems, even though Jesus was. But later on, something happened to the people of God. By the time we get to this point in Acts, Peter has been transformed. So have the other apostles. They have become people of prayer. We see it also in the life of Paul. Paul is able to say later on in the New Testament that he prays unceasingly. He never stops praying. And you get a picture in, in places like Ephesians and Colossians where Paul is just praying and praying for the people of God right through the night with power and with effect. So the first thing that we can notice is that prayer for the early church was a large thing for them. Whereas for so many of us, it has become quite small. We've pushed it into the corners of our life so often. Uh, that's a generalisation. I'm sure even in this room, there are people who are an exception to that. But to a very large extent, the church in the West has made prayer suddenly really quite small. Another big contrast is that for the early church, when they prayed, they really believed that they would get answers. They were faith-filled. They were expectant. They were convinced that what they prayed for in Jesus' name would be granted, didn't they? They drew upon all these promises that Jesus himself had given to them 
that their prayers would be answered, and they believed it. And because of that, their prayers were effective. And yet for so many of us, and I know I have walked in this myself, our prayers today are small, and rather than being believing, they are often unbelieving. We find it hard to believe that God will do anything. I know, it can be really tough, that's why. And also, and connected to that, our prayers are often ineffective. Even when we do pray, it seems that we don't get answers. And yet now is a time when we need to rediscover what prayer is. I'm certainly not the only person who's saying this. Many observers of the church uh, in the Western world Um, have noted these same things. For example, Stanley J. Grenz, who was uh, one of the notable theologians in recent decades, in his book on prayer, Prayer the Cry for the Kingdom, said this, that the modern Western church may be characterised as the epitome of a prayerless church. Okay, that's a generalisation. There are some exceptions to that. But when you look across the sweep of what is happening amongst evangelicals in churches all over the Western world, we find that we have forgotten the power of prayer. And yet we come to a verse like this and we see that the early church knew what it was to pray in power and to be answered and they were filled with boldness. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? We need boldness if we are going to be witnesses to the gospel. And it's not something that we will ever find simply by looking inside ourselves. I know this from personal experience. I think I'm one of the most timid people I know. I get spooked by just about anything in life. Just ask my family. (laughs) But yet I'm not alone in that. And especially when it comes to sharing the gospel with people, it seems like there is this widespread reluctance on our, amongst us. We get so timid, we get so afraid. We don't have that boldness. And often we make a particular mistake. We think that we should be bold. And so at the point of need, we suddenly look into ourselves and we try and conjure up some boldness from within ourselves, don't we? We try and be courageous in certain situations in life. And yet, can we see from this verse, and it's not just this verse, it's the whole sweep of the New Testament revelation, but can we see from this verse that that's not where courage for witness was ever meant to come from? If we think of the disciples, like Peter, he was a mess back in the day, wasn't he? Do you remember what had happened just on the night when Jesus was betrayed? Peter couldn't stand, even though he said that he would never forsake Jesus Christ. When it came to it, he ended up denying him three times. Couldn't even say anything to a slave girl in the courtyard there when Jesus was taken before the Sanhedrin. He was an utter mess. But something radical happened to him so that by the time we reach this passage that we're looking at today, he was utterly transformed and he had become a man of boldness. So let's circle in to this story uh, that Will uh, opened up for us last week. Let me say just a few things um, about the beginning of the story there at the beginning of chapter 3, just for those who weren't here and for others who might need some reminding um, from last week. This is a story just after the day of Pentecost. We don't quite know how long. And Peter and John are going up to the temple, interestingly, to pray. It's three in the afternoon, and as we saw uh, last week, there was this man there who had been lame from birth. He couldn't even get into the temple himself. He had to be brought instead by uh, his friends, and they would plonk him down there in the temple courts. He couldn't uh, move, but he could beg for a living. And there was this man at the gate called Beautiful. And, of course, he asks Peter and John for money. Now, let's look and see what happens. You might remember from last week. Peter looks straight at him in verse 4, as did John, 
Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then verse 6, Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. Suddenly he's got something. Back in his previous life, he didn't have anything to give of any spiritual value to anyone. He was one of those who just ran away. But now, after the day of Pentecost, something has happened. He's now got something to give him. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And he takes him by the right hand and this man gets up and his feet and his ankles are healed and he's finally able to do something he has not been able to do in more than 40 years. He's able to walk. He's able to stand. He's able even to leap. It's quite dramatic there in the temple courts that day. There's this man who is entirely recognisable because he's been there begging every day for years and years. And suddenly this man, this notorious lame beggar, is up there completely healed. This is good. This is amazing. The change that has suddenly come to this man. And when all the people, it says in verse 9, saw him walking and praising God, they recognised him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Last week, Will pointed out that our presentation of the gospel is to be essentially in two ways, in word and in deed. Peter and John have just done a most amazing deed. In fact, it's a miraculous one in the name of Jesus. And now Peter takes the opportunity to get up in the crowd and to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus. This is a man transformed. He would never have done this in the past. Verse 12, verse 11 and 12. Uh, So while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished, came running, and Peter says this, and he begins to preach them to them. And he begins to preach this message that ends up a powerful evangelistic message. He's not afraid to say it like it is. He tells them that they need to repent. In fact, he tells them that they were complicit in the very death of Jesus in that city just a few weeks before. And he tells them to repent and he tells them about the death of Jesus for them and he tells them about the resurrection of Jesus. And he makes this massive impact upon the people. It seems there are hundreds there, if not thousands, because later on in chapter 4 we we learn that the number of believers rises to 5,000 men and more because of this particular day. Hundreds of people are there and they are being uh, deeply convicted by the Spirit of God. And so we come to our chapter today. And the reason that I wanted to recap that story was because chapter 4 opens when Peter is literally in mid-sentence. He is still preaching to the crowd. He has already laid out for them the the way of salvation and it has already been having a, a mighty effect upon the crowd. But then suddenly he sees this other group coming through the crowd towards him. That's the beginning of chapter four. He's still preaching. Can you see it there in verse one? The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. So we've got this delegation, and it's not just an ordinary delegation, it's a delegation of some of the highest religious leaders in Jerusalem. It's priests, it's the captain of the temple guard, who John Stott tells us in his commentary, was second only to the high priest in Jerusalem. And it's a whole group of Sadducees who are coming. They were the ruling class in Jerusalem at the time. And there's Peter. He's just a Galilean fisherman speaking in a Galilean accent. He's been untrained. He's got nothing in terms of professional um, level in order to be able to speak to the crowd. And yet it's him who is now speaking powerfully powerfully 
to hundreds of people. Verse 2, so these Jewish leaders were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And so right there in the middle of Peter's sermon, they seize him and John and they drag him away because it was evening by then. So you can see that Peter's been speaking for quite a while. He had arrived in the temple precincts at what? 3 p.m. we're told in this story. And he's now been preaching and preaching. And because it's evening, they now throw him in to the lockup until the next day. But notice verse 4. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. And yes, it probably is only counting the men at this point because that's fairly clearly in the text as we have it. So it includes also many women and children. So the final number is in fact many, many thousands of people who have now been added to the church in this day. A great revival has suddenly come to Jerusalem on this day also. But we can see at this point this first great outbreak of opposition to the gospel. Back on the day of Pentecost, it was just this amazing thing and it just seemed to flow and people heard about Jesus in all these different languages and 3,000 people were converted. But on this day, as well as thousands more being converted, there is now this opposition from the highest figures in the land. And think about it. These were precisely the Jewish leaders that had arrested Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane and condemned him to death. This was the same group. That is made explicit in the next number of verses. Look at verse 5. The next day, so Peter and John have been in the lockup overnight, but the next day they're going to now appear before the Sanhedrin, the same Sanhedrin that had arrested Jesus and had condemned him and then handed him over to the Romans. How do you think Peter and John are feeling at this point? The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem, that's the Sanhedrin, were told that the, the high priest was there, Annas, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them, by what power or what name did you do this? And it seems that they also had the lame beggar from the day before because there's a reference to him coming up also in the text. So he was there as well. So you've got this really bizarre situation. They are trying to come down heavy on Peter and John, say, how on earth did you do this? But there is absolutely no question about the power of it because the man is just there, standing, no longer there on the floor. The lame man has been healed and there he is in the crowd still. Verse 8. Now before we look at this, think again. Well, what would Peter be thinking? Do you remember the last time he was anywhere near the Sanhedrin? It was on that night that Jesus was betrayed. He had already fled with all the other disciples when Jesus was arrested. He had just a little ounce of courage to go into the courtyard but no further. But when it came to it, he denied Jesus three times. He had no, no boldness, no courage, no outspokenness, no freedom. He was a broken man. Now he's up before the same crowd, the same high priest. How's he going to react? That's why verse 8 is so extraordinary, because it's so entirely different. Holy Spirit said to them and he goes into this sermon in front of them and notice it doesn't simply say that Peter said to them don't read it that quickly notice what's there in the middle Peter filled with the Holy Spirit that's the difference here he is he's already experienced Pentecost now again he is filled with the Holy Spirit and so he is able to speak to them with incredible courage and boldness 
and outspokenness and freedom. He says to them, Know this, you and all the people of Israel, in verse 10, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed, because he's just there. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. And then he says this, verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. That is boldness right there. That is courage right there. That is outspokenness right there. Verse 13, all of the Sanhedrin recognises that boldness that has been given to them by the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, when they saw the courage, and there's that same word in the Greek, that word that can be translated, boldness, courage, outspokenness, freedom. When they saw that in Peter and John, And then they realised that they were unschooled, ordinary men. Two really interesting words there. They were unschooled. That means they were untrained. They hadn't gone through theological school. There in the middle of Jerusalem were the most highly trained scribes and Bible teachers that existed in the land. And they were sitting there in the Sanhedrin. But Peter and John weren't those. They were just Galilean fishermen. They'd never had a chance to go to higher learning. And that astounded the Sanhedrin. The other word that's used, that's translated ordinary there, another interesting word in the Greek, it's idiotes, from which we get our word idiots. When they saw that they were just unschooled and idiots, well, actually, that word has shifted a bit in English, but back then, that particular word meant that they were non-professionals, They were amateur. And what an incredible picture that is for pretty much every one of us sitting in the seats here this morning. Because we too are untrained and we are non-professionals when it comes to the word of God. And so were Peter and John. They were just Galilean fishermen. And yet they had been filled with the Holy Spirit to the extent that they were now being used to impact thousands of people. Isn't that amazing? It's us. It's us as ordinary disciples that the Holy Spirit had taken a hold of for the gospel of Jesus Christ. What are we going to do with these men The Sanhedrin says in verse 16, Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Remember, this was the highest judicial religious body in the land. They had the power to command the people in Israel and even to exact great punishments upon them, as we saw, of course, with Jesus Christ himself. So they call them in again, and they command Peter and John not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Can you see this has gone up a ratchet? Now they are threatening them, saying, you must not any more speak about Jesus. Now what's Peter going to do? with his record. He's still filled with the Holy Spirit. He's still bold. He's still courageous and outspoken and free. And so he says this, Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to God? That's such a good question to put to religious leaders, isn't it? (laughs) Religious leaders often want you to listen to them, but of course they also believe that God is the highest power So, of course, the real answer to that question has got to be, well, you've got to listen to God. And then verse 20. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And this totally undoes the Sanhedrin that day. They just don't know what to do next. There's still this big crowd around who have been affected by this miracle. They've still got this man there who has been healed and is on his two feet. So after further threats... They let them go. 
But you can see how opposition now on the church is tightening. It's getting worse for them. And in fact, it's going to get worse, and we'll see that in coming chapters. And that leads us then to the final little section that we're looking at today, this prayer meeting. Peter and John get released, and they go back to the other believers. This is verse 23 and onwards. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people, reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. And they begin to pray, Sovereign Lord, they said, and they point out that God is the very one who has made the heavens and the earth. He is the Lord of all. We need to be reminded of that, especially when it comes to prayer that God really is the sovereign Lord of this entire globe, of this entire universe. That's what they focus upon. And then, interestingly, they then focus upon a couple of verses from one of the Psalms. And it's from Psalm 2. And they quote it back to God, which is a good practice in prayer, actually. At least for us, I don't know how much it does for God, but it certainly helps us. They quote back these two verses from Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Why do the kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord? It's a wow of a psalm, by the way, if you know it or if you want to go and look at it. That's the psalm which shows that the entire world is against God and all the leaders of the world are against God. That's why we live in a godless world. And yet in that very psalm, God declares that he is actually the one in charge. And more than that, that he has placed his own son, the Messiah, to be king of all the earth. They quote that back to him and then they link it with what has happened so recently in Jerusalem with the Jews and also with the Gentile leaders. Herod, Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city, they say in their prayer, to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. But now verse 29, this is the great prayer. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. There's that word again. Boldness, courage, outspokenness, freedom. That's what they pray for. They also pray for miracles, and that we see later on in chapter 5 at the hands of the apostles. But this cry for boldness by the Holy Spirit gets immediately answered. And a bit unlike the miracles, which tend to be here and there, and often in the hands of the apostles, this holy boldness is given to all people. And so we come back to that final verse we're looking at. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all, all of them, all of the ordinary Christians living in Jerusalem at the time, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God boldly. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much that you have given to us this enormous gift of the Holy Spirit and that one of the great cries of our heart is met by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that he will come and fill us and give us boldness and courage and outspokenness and freedom to speak in ways that we cannot find in ourselves. Lord, we pray that you would um, move amongst us so that this can become a reality uh, in more and more amongst us, Lord, as we prepare to be witnesses for you in our own communities. Lord, let it not be in our own strength, but with the mighty strength of Jesus.
And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.